Good morning, church, and welcome to the 7.30 a.m. service. I invite all of us to rise together for our opening hymn, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord be with you. Let us pray to collect for purity as we prepare our hearts to worship to our Almighty God together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and wordly magnify your holy name to Christ our Lord. Amen. The summary of the law. Our Lord Jesus said, the first commandment is this. The Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, 
and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us and write this laws in our hearts. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with all men. Please kneel as you are able. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed. Through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. And it is by God's grace and through the finished work of the cross that we receive God's forgiveness this morning. And Almighty God forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As God's forgiven people, let us rise and sing the Gloria in Excelsis. Please remain standing as we pray the collect, the seventh Sunday after Trinity. Almighty God, you send your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church. Open our hearts to the riches of His grace that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love and joy and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the first reading. The scripture reading appointed for this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, 
to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gradual hymn, Lord, thy word abideth. Hear the Gospel of Christ according to Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 to 18. Glory to Christ, our Saviour. Matthew, chapter 16, reading from verse 13. And now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we humble ourselves before your word, and we pray that it will be to us a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And this we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. I saw a new world. Everything was new. I had a new outlook, new experiences, new attitudes to other people. I loved God. Jesus Christ became the center of everything. I had been quickened, and I was really alive. This was the response of John McKay, the former president of Princeton Theological Seminary, after he had studied Paul's letter to the Ephesians. McKay went so far as to say that he owed it his life and this weekend, we begin a new sermon series on this letter. Letter, as you know, uh, is also called an epistle. That's kind of a fancy word for letter. And today, I will present an overview of this book to prepare us for the journey ahead and hope to frame the series in a way that will help us to better understand Paul's letter. I'll also unpack in the first two verses what we might call Paul's introduction to his letter. So what do we know about the letter to Ephesians? Christian tradition teaches us that Paul's letter was written to the churches in Ephesus and the surrounding region. It was probably written around AD 62 when Paul was a prisoner under house arrest in Rome. And we can read about that in Acts 28. What do we know of the city of Ephesus? It was the capital city of the Roman province of Asia. It was a busy commercial port. And it was the center of worship of Diana, the Roman equivalent of the Greek goddess Artemis. And in Acts 19, we would read of a riot in Ephesus, and the people were shouting, Great is Artemis, 
of the Ephesians. And that's kind of the context that Paul is addressing. And what did he want to say to these churches? You find that in this letter, he doesn't directly address specific situations or events in Ephesus. This is something that he often does in his letters to churches. He speaks about pastoral issues, about very specific matters. But in this letter, you don't really see that happening. His writing here is more broad, more general. And many scholars believe that this letter might have been intended to be a circular letter, meaning one that would be distributed to other churches for their reading. The main theme of this epistle could be presented as follows. Christ has reconciled all peoples to himself and to each other in one body, and that is the church. This work of divine grace is to be received by faith, and it should lead God's people to a pattern of living that befits it. Hence, the title of our sermon series, Unity and Maturity in the Body of Christ in the Church. And he writes, says of Ephesians, that even though this letter isn't very long, it's not very comprehensive, when compared to some of Paul's other writings, it does give us a bird's eye view of some critical themes in early Christian reflection. Paul writes about God, the world, Jesus, the church, the means of salvation, Christian behavior, marriage and family, and spiritual warfare. And so this book covers a lot of theological ground in six rather short chapters. Early on, I quoted John McKee, and he said that after he had studied the book of Ephesians, everything was new. And John Stott's outline of Paul's letter stresses this same concept of newness, and Stott highlights four aspects of newness. First, there is the new life which God has given to us in Christ. And we see that in chapter 1, verse 3, all the way through to chapter 2, verse 10. We see the new society which God has created through Christ, chapter 2, verse 11, to chapter 3, verse 21. And this new society, this new citizenship has become ours. And there are new standards which God expects of this new society, especially unity and purity. God calls us to a new pattern of living, chapter 4, verse 1, to chapter 5, verse 21. And there are new relationships into which God has brought us. There is to be harmony in the home, but hostility to the devil, chapter 5, verse 21, all the way through to chapter 6, verse 24. And so there's new life, there's a new society, there are new standards, and there are new relationships. Everything made new. Everything made new. There are different ways of describing the contents of this epistle. If you read different writings, different commentaries, we all get different perspectives, but the essence of it is this. God has done something amazing for us. And this must lead to our transformation. This must lead to our transformation. Paul's letter proclaims who God is and what he's done for his people and lays out the corresponding implications for how we are to live. And the church's way of life should be a response to the grace of God. The church's way of life should be a response to the grace of God of God. This letter is theologically rich. There is a lot to unpack, and there's lots for us to learn and to apply. But before getting into the text, we should address an important question, one that isn't always explained in church. I think many of us, we, we understand it, and many of us kind of assume that everyone understands it, but it's something that may be at the back of our minds, especially if we are new believers. I know that when I first started attending church, it was something I didn't understand, but eventually it was made known to me. And the question is this, what does a letter that Paul wrote to a church so many years ago have to do with us? Because he's not addressing us directly, and yet we receive Scripture as though it is meant for us. And this has to do with how Scripture speaks to us as God's people. The Bible is God's revelation, His Word to us. The Holy Spirit inspired the writers of Scripture, and through its words, He continues to speak to us today we might say that God still speaks through what He has spoken. God still speaks through what He has spoken. And we actually see this happening even in the Bible itself, because in the New Testament, the believers were receiving the Word of God as something that God was bringing to them in their time, even though they weren't the direct recipients of those words as we see in the Old Testament. 
And so we are in the same position, a similar position. We are receiving these words as God brings them to us. Scripture contains timeless principles, principles that reflect God's heart, His purpose for His people. And these principles guide us today, even if our present situation may not be exactly the same as that of the Bible's first readers or hearers. When handling Scripture, our responsibility is to carefully and prayerfully discern how to apply these principles in a way that will be obedient to God's revelation. Paul writes to Timothy, all Scripture is breathed out by God. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that a man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The words of Scripture are to be received and applied for our teaching, for our reproof, and that means it will show us what God disapproves of, for our correction, for our training in righteousness and holiness in the ways of God. And the result is that we will be made complete, we will be made ready, we will be equipped for every good work. I thought I would interrupt my sermon with a short commercial here and remind you that there is an upcoming course on Bible interpretation and we highly recommend this course to you. It will be taught by Dr. Tan Kim Kwat from Theolo uh, Trinity Theological College. He's an excellent teacher, and he's actually going to help us to better understand these approaches. How do we receive the Word of God, and how do we interpret it and then apply it in our lives? Registration will close on 2nd August, just a few days away. Uh, this is kind of like publicized as something for Bible study leaders, but it's really something that every believer should be doing in our study of the Scriptures. And so I encourage you to sign up if you have not done so. We'll find that the Bible is absolutely relevant and applicable when we study it with the right attitude, with the right approach, with the right skills and with the right tools, and we can gain those things. And as we look at this ancient letter, I believe that God will continue to speak to us, every one of us, if we approach Him with an open heart. And so now let's dive into the first two verses of this book, Paul's introduction. And I'll read to us from N.T. Wright's translation of this text. And he writes, From Paul, one of King Jesus' apostles through God's purpose, to the holy ones in Ephesus who are also loyal believers in King Jesus, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus the King give you grace and peace. And now let's unpack these two verses in three parts. And first we see that Paul introduces himself as an apostle, and an apostle is a sent one, a sent one, one who is sent. And Paul is saying that as an apostle of Christ, he has been sent by Christ to preach the gospel. He's been sent by Christ on a God-given mission. The term apostle is typically used to refer to an eyewitness of Jesus, one who had seen him, one who had seen him at work, the things that he did, and so isn't relying on, on hearsay, what other people would say about Jesus, but had encountered him personally. Now, Paul, as an apostle, recognized that he had been chosen and sent by Christ to serve God's purpose and to fulfill God's mission. And we aren't apostles, but we should have similar clarity and conviction, just as Paul did. Our mission might be different from his in some ways, but we have to discern what God has called us to do. And then we should give ourselves fully to do it and to do it well. One question that we should ask ourselves is this, who's calling the shots in my life? Who's calling the shots in my life? And if our answer is anything other than God, then I suggest to us that we have missed the mark. We have fallen short of God's intent for us. Secondly, Paul addresses the recipients of his letter as saints. And he's not referring to a, a chosen group of the spiritual elite in the church. He's not identifying just a few to receive that address. No, he's speaking of the whole church, all of God's people. In our common usage, we use the term saint to refer to someone who is very righteous, very holy, very spiritual. But that's not at all what Paul has in mind here. Paul isn't saying just this group of people. No, he's saying everyone in the church. You are saints. Saints are those who are in Christ. Those who are in Christ, and they have been declared righteous. 
by Jesus' work on the cross. It's not really about what they have done, it's about what Christ has done. They may be struggling to live up to their calling, they may be falling short in many areas of their lives, they may be what we often refer to as works in progress, but in Christ, they are saints. This identity is based not on their works, but on their reception of Christ's works. And we'll find that this point is stressed later in Paul's letter. And friends, the same goes for us, for you and for me. We are saints. And take a moment to let that sink in. These saints are described by Paul as faithful in Christ. And that means after having received Jesus' works, there is a response that is expected of them, a response of faithfulness, a commitment to walk in the ways of Christ. And you find the focus here is not simply about, for example, saying the sinner's prayer. It's not just church attendance or cell group attendance, even though all that's important. It's not about how long they have been in church or how long they've been serving or what ministries they serve in. No. Now, there's a place for all that and it's of value, but that's not where the focus lies. What matters is faithfulness to Jesus. To be more precise, it is faithfulness demonstrated in discipleship, a commitment to follow Christ in every area of life. It's not about intellectual agreement with certain teachings, but it's a life that reflects a true commitment of the heart, a dedication to follow Jesus. We are God's people, my friends. We are saints through the work of Christ on the cross, and we are to commit ourselves wholly, unreservedly, to be His disciples, to follow and to obey Him. Note that our identity in Christ is not individualistic. Now, we do make a personal commitment to follow Him, yes, but this commitment has to be lived out in community, not in isolation. In modern Christianity, sometimes you hear people saying all these spiritual things, it's really just about me and God. It's about this private experience. I work everything out with God. They reject accountability. They reject community. And when you look at Scripture, you realize that's not God's idea of the Christian life at all. Paul addresses the saints plural, and he reminds them that they are part of Christ's body. Their obedience to God must be demonstrated as part of and within this community. John Stott writes, to be in Christ is to be personally and vitally united to Christ, as branches are to the vine and members to the body, and thereby also to Christ's people. For it is impossible to be part of the body without being related to both the head and the members. Much of what the epistle later develops is already here in bud. And we will see that a major theme in this letter is the body of Christ, the church, how God desires us as members of one body to walk in unity and maturity. Now, this community life, this shared spiritual life, has to go beyond just being in the same physical space for two hours a week or less, attending a worship service together. It has to go much deeper than that. And especially nowadays, after this period of time when the online platforms have served us well as a necessary uh, substitute for in-person services, we have to recognize, I guess I'm addressing our friends who are joining us online, that being connected virtually is not God's intention for His church. It's not enough. It served us for a time, but it won't suffice. And even as we're gathered here, it's not enough just to be here in this hall together and say we are one church. God's desire for the church in our community life has to go much deeper. For me, in my own personal faith journey, this is one of the lessons I think God has been teaching me and I continue to have to learn. And that is to look simply beyond myself. To realize that life is not just about me, but about us. And so much of life, so much especially of the spiritual life, has to be understood in this corporate and communal sense. Thirdly, Paul pronounces upon the church grace and peace from God. And there's a lot that can be said about grace and about peace. 
could preach entire sermon series on them. Let me just touch on them briefly here. And as we think about grace, we think about God's gift. Very often we think about His initiative to save humanity from our sins. The church exists because she has received the grace of God revealed to us in Christ. Now, God's free and undeserved mercy is expressed in so many different forms. It's a reflection of His generous love. The greatest of it is the gift of His Son. The gift of His Son. The book of Ephesians is so full of references to divine grace that some call it the epistle of grace. The epistle of grace. And this will be further unpacked in the weeks to come. As we think about peace, well, we often think about it as a sense of calm within us, uh, in inner peace. And God does grant us this inner comfort, especially in times of trouble, and it's precious. But the biblical understanding of peace is far more rich and complex. It goes much deeper than that. Because peace means reconciliation. Peace means reconciliation. It means that the war is over, enmity is abolished, resolved. We are no longer enemies of God and we are no longer enemies of each other because in Christ, God has reconciled us to Himself and also to one another. Today we will share the peace as part of our Holy Communion service and this is something that we are very familiar with. And it's not just a time where we conveniently greet the people in our vicinity, it's not just a time where we greet those whom we like, It's an expression of the shared life of the church that as we are gathered as God's people, we are one body and we share this life together regardless of whether we get along well with each other, regardless of our differences and our disagreements, we have to affirm our oneness in Christ. It means that we have to deal with our own discomforts with others here. I'm not very sure if sometimes you are a bit happy Uh, to know that someone you don't like very much sits at the other end of the sanctuary. And I know many of us who come to the cathedral, we have our favourite seats. And maybe the lack of proximity makes us feel a little bit more at ease. But you don't share peace with those within three metres, five metres of where you are seated. The peace is shared with everyone here. And that's true even for us as pastors, as celebrants, as we lead everyone in the liturgy to call for a sharing of God's peace, we too are brought into a place where we have to affirm our oneness despite our disagreements and our differences. And that's at the heart of God's purpose for His church. And I assure you it's difficult to live out and to embrace because of our own failings. And yet it's essential. And this is so much emphasised in Paul's letter Ephesians is a lot about ecclesiology, about the doctrine of the church, to bring us to a deeper understanding of who God has called us to be. When Paul writes of grace and peace, he presents a a summary, if you like, a proclamation of gospel in its essence, because they speak of redemption and reconciliation. Redemption and reconciliation. And just two verses of his letter, Paul is already introducing significant sub-themes and theological ideas that he will develop later. As we make our journey through this book, well, let's ask God to teach us through His Word who we are called to be, what His church is called to be. Let us learn to walk in unity and maturity and purity and love. We have to acknowledge that we are a work in progress. We've got a long way to go. And very often, the church behaves in a manner that reflects the heart of man much more than it reflects the heart of God. John Stott once lamented that there is a superficiality in the discipleship of the church, and we see this everywhere. He's spoken to different church leaders who acknowledged that there was a lack of godliness and integrity in their congregations. Some would say that the church lacked a strong biblical and theological foundation. And Stott described the church as in a state of growth without death. Growth without death. And we could paraphrase that as growth without maturity. 
growth to adult maturity. I'm going to reference Colossians 1, verses 28 to 29. And, and many of us would know that Colossians is a letter that bears many similarities with Ephesians, and they were likely written around the same time. And Paul writes, Him we proclaim, Christ we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. And Paul labored and toiled and struggled with God-given energy to present the people of God mature in Christ. He discipled and mentored others so that they would grow spiritually. And this was, if you like, his KPI. It was the measure of his success in ministry, the fruit of his labor. And if we want to be fruitful in God's kingdom, and I pray that we do, then this has to be our KPI as well. That we should be growing in maturity and we should be helping others to do so as well. In closing, I believe that in this season, God is calling us to be shaped and transformed by His Word, transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit. He's calling us to experience newness of life and to grow in unity and maturity. He's calling us to lead a life of discipleship that reflects the reality of His grace and its ongoing work in our lives. And I pray that our study of the epistle of grace will help us to do so. Let me return to John McKay's testimony that we began with. And he said, after studying the book of Ephesians, I saw a new world. Everything was new. I had a new outlook, new experiences, new attitudes to other people. I loved God. Jesus Christ became the center of everything. I had been quickened. I was really alive. And I pray that many of us will be touched and transformed by Paul's letter to the Ephesians so that we can heartily echo these words. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank Reverend Christopher Chan for sharing the Word of God. May the Lord seal His Word in our hearts. Let us rise to affirm our faith in God in the words of the Nicene Creed. Together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, like from light, through God from through God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please kneel as you are able for a time of intercession. O God, who exercises loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth, we come before you humbly, acknowledging and repenting our sins. May the words of our mouths and meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For the world, we uplift to you all nations to strengthen surveillance and public health measures to counter the increasing spread of monkeypox 
a disease affecting nearly 16,000 people in 75 countries. We pray, Lord, for coordinated advancement in vaccine research and for effective prevention and control of the infection in all hospitals and clinics. Lord, in your mercy. For Singapore, we uplift our nation's leaders unto your care and pray for dedicated hearts and minds to lead and guide the country in ways of justice and peace with godly wisdom. We commend to you the Ministry of Health, the Health Sciences Authority, and the Expert Committee on COVID-19 Vaccination as they study the safety and effectiveness of specially formulated COVID-19 vaccines for young children under the age of five, as well as for continued vigilance by everyone to keep our communities safe. We also ask you to heal the sick and comfort families who have lost loved ones due to COVID. Lord, in your mercy. For the Diocese of Singapore, we commend unto your fatherly goodness, Bishop Titus Chung, the cathedral canons, and all the clergy under their care. As the diocese continues to serve you faithfully, we remember Singapore Anglican Community Services and St. Andrew's Mission Hospital and ask for your continued presence that they will be a shining light in society, relieving suffering and enriching lives with your love. Continue to bring in more full-time chaplains, effect spiritual breakthroughs in the lives of the beneficiaries, staff, and let all who serve in these ministries daily give of their best to you. Lord, in your mercy. For St. Andrew's Cathedral, we pray for clergy, staff, and members as they serve you with devotion, in unity, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Anoint all involved in the pulpit ministry, Lord, as the team actively preaches your word during weekday and weekend services so that we will be deeply rooted in your word and grow into a vibrant, word-centered community who are committed to following you. We also ask you to strengthen the children's ministry in bringing in more Sunday school teachers. May the spiritual nurture and role modeling of our teachers lay strong faith foundations in our children's lives, that they may be filled with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner fully pleasing to you, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Lord, in your mercy, our prayer. Remembering our brothers and sisters, Lord, who are unwell, look upon them with the eyes of mercy, comfort them with a sense of goodness, preserve them from the temptations of the enemy, and grant patience under their affliction. In your good time, restore them to health and enable them to lead the remainder of their lives in godly fear to your glory, and grant that finally they may dwell with you in life everlasting. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please, please be seated. We thank uh, Anatan for leading us in intercession. A blessed uh, morning, brothers and sisters in Christ and those worshipping with us live at home. We would like to acknowledge those of you who are here for the first time Please put up your hand so that we can welcome you. Anyone? Okay, welcome back, everybody. Eh? Okay, welcome to the 7.30 a.m. service. Uh, here are some announcements. The first announcement is Bible Interpretation Course. The introduction to Bible Interpretation Course is designed to equip Bible study leaders with the basic principles of Bible study and to support them in their role as channels uh, for God's words. The course is also suitable for those who simply want to learn how to handle the Word of God correctly. Registration for this course will close on 2nd of August 
to scan the QR code to register before the closing date. The next announcement is a spiritual care for the aging. This course is open for registration. Let's watch a video to find out more about the course. Medical science has brought about countless breakthroughs in the way we care for older people. But it's also led to a realisation physical and mental health are essential, but not enough. A person is more than just a body connected to a brain. True, holistic care means understanding and supplying their spiritual needs as well. Professor John Swinton is a world-renowned expert in dementia and meaningful ageing just one of the many recognised experts, contributing their wisdom. The Spiritual Care series is built on eight episodes that are as practical as they are professionally informed, with access to all materials online for consolidated learning. The course workbooks are supported by videos, interviews, animations, group discussions and practical exercises. If you know of any caregivers and those ministering to the elderly in your midst, uh, who will benefit from this course, please invite them to register for it. Please scan the QR code for more information about the course. That's all for the announcement. Thank you. Thank you, David, for the announcements. Could I invite all of us to rise together? We thank God for Reverend Chris's message for us today. Just reminded that we are called to be a church, a body, a community. And in this shared life that we have together, we experience God's peace and peace with one another. And so therefore, we are the body of Christ. And in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. So let us pursue all that makes for peace and builds our common life. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. We share the peace of one another. Let us sing the offertory hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessings.
Let's give thanks to God together. And Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And please rise to receive the blessing. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your heart and mind in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. And so, brothers and sisters, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. We have come to the end of our service. The closing hymn, Blessed Be the Name. <laughs>